This podcast is sponsored by ORCHSE Strategies, an industry leader in developing innovative and sustainable approaches for protecting workers and the environment. ORC membership includes EH&S vice presidents, directors, and senior managers from over 120 large global corporations in 20 different industry sectors. Many member companies like General Electric and Alcoa and GM and ExxonMobil and DuPont and Duke Energy and Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics and Allergen and Procter & Gamble and 3M have very well-established reputations as industry leaders in eh <laughs> That's like reading the greatest hits list. The value provided by the organization comes from harnessing the collective wisdom of all of these members and from the guidance and facilitation and expertise from the staff with decades of experience in EHS. If you're interested in learning more about the unique opportunities available through ORCHSE, please contact Linda Haney at 202 510 0509. Or you can pop Linda an email at lynda.haney at ORCHSE.com. That's Linda, L I N D A dot Haney, H A N E Y, at O-R-C-H-S-E dot com. Now, the podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am your host for today. I'm Todd Conklin, and I'm so glad you're listening. This podcast is a big one. Now, you know, we get lots of rock stars on this podcast. We don't want for famous people. That's kind of a blessing, sort of. I mean, it really makes it kind of cool. But today, I don't know. I'm going to mention a name, and some of you are going to just kind of swoon and fall over backwards, and some of you are going to say, what? Who is Who's that? Today's podcast is uh, Edgar Schein. And Edgar Schein is remarkable for about a million reasons. But one of the most important reasons is he is probably the foremost expert and authority on culture, organizational culture. And and Ed Schein said, we were at a meeting in Berkeley a couple weeks ago, that's how Kimmy's on the podcast, Ed Schein said, you know, I'm a reluctant safety person. I never asked to be a safety person. I had safety kind of thrust upon me because of the work I did around culture. And I actually think that's a really good way to think about probably all of us. Reluctant safety people, safety was sort of thrust upon us. But to hear Ed Shine talk about culture, well, quite honestly, today's a really special podcast. I mean, I don't know where you would go to find this. I don't know who you'd have to talk to. You just have to be kind of lucky. And to hear him just directly correct me, and you'll hear him correct me, um, which is fine. I mean, I, th- I love that, right? That's a part of kind of what this dialogue's about. And, and, and Ed's going to talk about, really, he's going to talk about safety and culture and resilience and reliability. And Shine's written a ton of stuff. Probably the book that I think of as his kind of seminal work, and it's in its fourth edition right now, is called Organizational Culture and Leadership. If you haven't seen it, read it, heard of it, seen it in a class, I'll be a little surprised, but if you haven't, you ought to probably pick it up. It's going to really change the way you think about culture. Shine's got a bunch of uh, other books as well. His Humble Inquiry stuff, The Gentle Art of Asking Instead of Telling, is remarkable. His, His work... Um, at this point in his career now, it is really centered around sort of this notion of humility and the ability to intervene. But he talks about culture in, in such an amazing way. In, in fact, Shine's notion is that we can't even use the word safety culture because you can't really attach the word culture to an amorphous thing like safety. And, and we all know that safety is a pretty difficult thing to describe. Culture doesn't belong to a thing Culture belongs to people, and and that's what he talks about. And and he builds sort of a case that we have to be able to attach safety to people and that safety culture is really the sort of organizational and operational people in the positions sharing a sense of values. And and he builds a case, um, and and you've probably seen this. If you've sat through any class I've ever taught, I've probably talked about it, that we start with some assumptions about the organization 
which then cause us to create values, the things for which we'll give up our life's energy, right? And those values then create artifacts. So we have beliefs, values, and actions, and they're all interconnected. Maybe the best way to have this conversation is for me to just shut up a while and introduce you, ladies and gentlemen of the podcast, my best friends ever who listen to this thing. Let's listen to Ed Shine, and his son Peter is going to be with him as well. Let's listen to Ed and Peter Shine talk about safety and culture. Listen carefully, you guys, because this is worth its weight in gold. So go ahead, fire away. What <laughs> your questions? And uh, Peter and I are here, and if we can answer them, that's great. Mostly, what I want to want to capture is in our meeting in Berkeley, they were talking about culture as if they invented culture, as if it was a, a, a new phenomena. And, and Dr. Sean, you said something really interesting. You said culture is, can't be attached to an amorphous thing like an organization, that culture has to belong to people. And I'd love it if you just spent some time telling us about that idea, about, about how we've drifted over time to thinking that culture is something the organization owns and lost track with the fact that culture is something that the people own. Well, I'd be happy to comment on that. I think the the first question to answer is why are why do we need the word culture at all when we already have lots of other good words like group and norm and values and beliefs? So the thing that appeals to me about the word and how I've always used it and how it should be used, it refers to when things like beliefs, values, or rules are actually shared by a group of people with emphasis on the word shared. So if indeed all the members of an organization share a value like the customers first or in a hospital, let's do everything for the patient, and they they really believe that, that's not just a, a thing that's thrown out there and their behavior and everything they do is guided by that. Or in the safety area, if indeed all the members of a nuclear plant believe that it is essential to be totally safe, then it's legitimate to say that that organization has that kind of a culture that believes in some central value. But the emphasis is always on sharing. If it isn't shared by a number of people, then the word culture shouldn't be used. And I was thinking about this, actually, as I was looking ahead to this podcast, that probably the most important cultural issue in the safety area is when different cultural values clash with each other Specifically, where we want, say, the nuclear plant to be safe or the hospital to be safe, but there is a higher order norm operating out of the culture of society which says don't rat on your buddies. So if a doctor sees another doctor doing something that's unsafe, will he blow the whistle on it or not. If a maintenance person in a nuclear plant sees a fellow employee doing something that's unsafe, will he tell a supervisor or not? I bring that up because it illustrates that culture is really very complex. So you could argue that, well, a plant has a central value of safety but we can't forget that there is another culture operating that has to do with hierarchy and loyalty to peers and stuff like that. So does that get us started on, on how culture is serious business and always involves people? 
Yeah, let me let me follow that up though by asking you to do a couple things for us. When you talk about values, what do you mean by values? And I should say editorially that pretty much the entire definition I use from values comes from you, so I'm a little biased towards your approach. But but that that notion of shared values is very powerful. What what do you mean by that? It's when several of us have the same priorities when when we have to make trade-offs between, say, safety or cost, or between doing things that are best for the doctors versus doing things that are best for the patients. If we say the patients are more important in the long run, that's a value statement. Values are what's most important, the things that take priority the things we will not give up. Those are values. And that point where we make those trade-offs, where we have those those conflicts, those those pain points, culture really plays a key role in helping us understand which direction we should move. I, I hesitate to call it a choice or even a decision because I think culture is so powerful, it sort of sets workers up towards moving one direction or another direction at one of those value clashing spots. Is that is that correct? Well, <clears throat> yes and no. What when you use the word culture in that general sense, you're in a sense missing the point that my example illustrates how there are two different cultures clashing with each other. The culture from the executive point of view of the nuclear plant says it's obvious that safety is our top values. But down in the plant, among the unionized employees, there is a superseding occupational value that says we don't rat on each other. Sure, we want to be safe and we respect management's values, and we also believe in that, but that does not supersede that that I would put my buddy into trouble or that I would get my fellow doctor fired because of something that I observed. So it's culture operates at many levels depending on what the group reference is that has created the particular values that they're operating by at any given moment. You are a a product of many different cultural experiences, and in different situations, different parts of those experiences will determine your daily behavior. That's remarkable, because if I can paraphrase, what you're telling me is there's no such thing as a safety culture. There's a a manager group who has values, which creates a culture that understands safety, and a worker group that has values, which creates a culture that understands safety, and that's where that conflict exists. Is that more accurate? That that is precisely the the paper that I wrote uh, attacking the concept of safety culture. I really said that the safety priorities at the executive level are different from the safety priorities at the middle management level, and they are even different at the level of the employee and the union. They all believe that safety is number one, but when you get them to define, well, what what do you actually mean by safety, it turns out that they have different value priorities at these different levels. Uh, At the top level, uh, the thing that they most want to avoid is killing somebody that will produce a scandal because that will really be bad for the business. At the worker level, the top priority may be let's us not get hurt. So they'll be paying much more attention to the OSHA stuff, the slips, trips, and falls. Middle managers, when you talk to them, they say, okay, safety is very important, but I can't afford to slip the productivity or the schedule goals. So they're they're each making different kinds of trade-offs, 
based on their occupational cultures and only the outsider comes believes that there is a single culture operating. That's remarkable. So the question begs to be asked, how does one intervene with these multiple cultures to create more resilience or more reliability or hospitals where patients are less likely to be injured by care or a, a nuke plant that has a, a scram event that fails? How do, how do we do those kind of interventions? Well, I think they have to start at the top because the values that the CEO and the top managers set do have an influence down the line. And if, if I were a hospital CEO or a plant manager of a nuclear plant, and I wanted people to really report on things that are unsafe, even to the point of reporting on their buddies, the first thing I would have to do is to change my own behavior vis-a-vis -vis my own immediate subordinates. I would have to say to them, look, we're in this together. I want complete openness from you guys. I even want you to tell on each other if there's something unsafe going on. If I don't set that climate for my immediate subordinates, I can't expect it to function down below by just announcing that I'm concerned about safety and openness and trust. I have to actually create it in the environment around me, which means I may have to change my own behavior, how I reward my subordinates, the kind of structures I create. The intervention from my point of view has to be at the top. But that's really scary. I mean, that's scary for the senior leaders. It's, it's frightening because it creates a sense of uncertainty. I mean, I think the reason they hold on to strong command and control models is because they believe that makes the culture more manageable, more understandable. I don't know what word I'm searching for. How do we, how, what advice would you give? Because that's the way to ask this question to these senior leaders to sort of think about themselves as, as creating those value sets that, that cascade all the way down to the plant level floor. Well, if, if I had a senior leader in the room, asking me this question uh, and saying, well, do you really want help? And I'm saying to him, do you really want help with this? And he or she says, yes, I'm really sincere. I really need, need to create this climate in my organization, in my hospital, in my nuclear plant. I would say, well, then let's talk right away first about how you manage the people under you. How do you view their roles? What do you expect of them? How do you reward them? And I would monitor very closely whether what this person describes to me is consistent with his or her own desire to create this trust and openness. And chances are we might have a very difficult conversation because he or she would slip into the yeah, but I've got to control this, I'm accountable, and I would have to keep saying, I understand that, but if, if you think that your accountability hinges on no more serious accidents, then I'm suggesting to you that the only way to really achieve that is to make sure your own behavior is consistent with that vis-a-vis -vis your subordinates and that you're holding them accountable for creating that same climate with their subordinates so that gradually it filters down into the organization. The leader has an important role. There's no question about it. What's your gut tell you about culture surveys, like safety culture surveys? You, you gloss that a little bit by saying, sure, the leader has an important role. I would say that's not the way I would put it. <laughs> <laughs> you can correct me any time, sir. I'm ready for it. The leader has the important role and possibly <laughs> the only role that really matters. If he screws it up and we then try to fix it down below, 
that's a losing proposition. So I would even argue that, that boards who appoint leaders should be thinking very carefully whether they're picking someone who has the kind of style and personality who's able to see this complex system and recognize that his or her own role is the most important first step in intervening in the system. You ask me, how do you intervene? I'm saying you intervene at the board and CEO level to make sure you've got the right people uh, creating and running the show. But I think that access is hard for some people. I mean, I think I think that's that's a door that's sometimes difficult to open. Todd, if it weren't hard, our hospitals and our plants would be safer. <laughs> I agree, my friend. I agree. Well, uh, what, what's, why what? do we have accidents and disasters? Because we don't have the leadership in every organization that can create an, an absolutely safe environment. There are industries that seem to do better at this, like the airlines. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the ratio of disasters to numbers of flights and, and things in the airline industry is truly remarkable uh, when you compare it to, to some other industries. So I've got to believe that the people who, who you know, run airlines are conscious of how important it is to get the right people onto an airplane to flying it. And there have been, you know, generations of research on how to make the cockpit relationship safer. It's, it's been a long haul to show that the captain of an airplane should not behave in a command and control way, but should view the flight engineer and the co-pilot as colleagues with whom there has to be very open, trusting communication. Because most, most of the accidents that have been analyzed carefully show that there's a breakdown in the communication in the flight crew, which is inexcusable. You know, we know better. But to create that environment in an airline that's also cost conscious and whatnot is probably difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, I I agree, and that that notion of crew resource management really, I think, it's it's in direct alignment with your idea that the culture of of a single airplane, there's the culture of the crew, right? There's the culture of the management of the airline, and they all come together um, to successfully move people from point A to point B. Um, it, that's well, well, you you said something very important to to move people from point A to point B, right? Right. Let me give you a quote from Sullenberger, the hero of that that landing that plane in the Hudson. You remember that incident? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I I once had a chance to meet him and asked him, you know, how does he create that climate in the cockpit? when he's often dealing with strangers, you know, who are just a sign. And he said something very interesting. He said, the first thing I do is when the crew comes together, I say, now let's remember what our job is. Our job is to get all the passengers and flight crew and ourselves back home to our families. That's rather different from saying moving people from point A to point B. Very much so. Very, very much so. And so that leads to the whole idea that I've been pushing in my humble consulting and my uh, humble inquiry books, that in order to create this more open, trusting environment, you have to personalize the relationship. The plant manager, the chief of the hospital, has to personalize his relationship with his or her immediate subordinates to get them to realize that our goal here 
is a is a human goal above everything else. It's not about staying profitable or whatever. It's about getting the people back to their families, about getting the patients to to be healthy again or whatever, or to stay healthy. That if you don't humanize the work relationship, you're not ever going to get the kind of openness and trust that you need so that people will actually identify safety problems if even a peer, a fellow union member is doing it. That humanization takes me really to that question I was attempting to squeeze in there earlier. How how's your gut feel on culture surveys? Because this is something that the people that listen to this podcast, I think, are constantly being barraged with the threat of a cultural survey. We'll bring in a cultural survey. What's what's your advice on that? I I'm going to let Peter answer that because he's far more into that field than I am. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'd love to have Peter on this. Yeah, you bet. Well, I mean, I think what Ed, you know, taught me a while ago about all of this that's important is it really starts with, you know, what what's the problem? It's, you know, do you have a culture problem or do you want to do a survey just to understand your culture? And I guess our feeling generally would be that if you don't have something that's troubling you or is troubling the CEO, what's the point of a culture survey? Um, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a um, diagnostic exercise that if it's diagnosing a problem, then it might be useful. If it's diagnosing um, a phenomenon just for the sake of understanding it, you know, I'm a little dubious. Um, it's important also to think about what, you know, what sort of tier of, of survey we're talking about. There are a lot of little software as a service providers out there that have apps and have, um, you know, little pulse surveys that ask about, you know, anywhere from one to ten questions on a very rapid, frequent basis. Um, it's, it's debatable whether that's a culture survey at all. That's really t- sort of asking um, employees to sometimes anonymously, sometimes not anonymously, um, make a characterization of how they're feeling that day at work. And in our um, you know, taxonomy about these things, that's really much more about climate and perception of what it's like to work at that company at that time or in that context at that time. Um, Culture surveys in, in their, you know, in their grandest form, the kind that companies like Human Synergistics and Denison and, uh, and you know, there's, there's many others. Those are the two that we're probably most familiar with. Those um, do get at great depth with a lot of real good, um, uh, you know, psychology and statistics at you know, important um, sets of variables that you really can associate with the um, core assumptions that drive the business at a much deeper level than how are people feeling about their jobs that day. But Peter, if I can interrupt, I I see those as kind of dangerous, sort of. I I think it's a dangerous intervention. Well, I I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it's, I mean, if you if you sense that you've got a problem that you can't put your finger on, um, I you know, well, I mean, one of the points I think you're making is that that it is an intervention; it's not a survey, and that we completely agree with. Um, but uh, if you're using it as a way to um, get at a, at a trying to understand a, a deeper level of assumptions that people have and beliefs that people have, and you're using it as a way to measure change over time, um, it may be worth the investment. The, I mean, to, 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 to do something one time and say, here's what we are, here's our culture, I agree with you, that seems like um, 
that is potentially, uh, you know, fraught with type one and type two errors. <laughs> yeah. There are going to be things that, that, that you're going to be, have false positives and false negatives all over the place. However, if you're using it as a, as, as something where you want to measure, um, the effectiveness of change programs, it may be very effective at doing that because these are very sophisticated surveys that are pretty hard to game. And um, so you may truly be getting at real moves in positive directions uh, or not. Um, but uh, the real, you know, uh, good surveys, I think, are effective at doing that. But it's a lot of work and it's expensive and, um I think part of what you're hearing from people being barraged with, you know, the opportunities to do culture surveys is these kind of quick and dirty, you know, yeah. um, smartphone-based kind of pulse surveys. And those are not culture surveys, I guess, at, at, a, at our, you know, if, if we were to be blunt, we don't really think of those as culture surveys, even though the companies that are doing them have names like Culture Amp and Culture IQ. Right, right. Those are interesting tools. Um, but those are more about sort of climate and engagement and less about, you know, what's truly, you know, the underlying beliefs and assumptions that oftentimes have come out of the history of the company, not out of the, um, you know, the current intent of the leadership team. So I'd be remiss, Peter, while I have you, you, you and Ed have a, have a consulting company, right? We do, yep. Yeah. We have a, a little LLC called or the uh, Organizational Culture and Leadership Institute. And you guys are you guys are willing and available to go into companies that are really struggling or or, or looking to improve. Fair enough. Yeah, I, but I think that that we we wouldn't say we're just because of the segue with surveys. We're not. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Sur- we, we would be in the business of providing context for people who are pondering doing it. Good survey. catch, my friend. Yes, good catch. In my mind, this is clearly different topics, but but that's that's we're running towards the end of our time. Ed, do you have any final comments for us? Any any words of brilliance that'll sort of set us off? Well, I think first I want to add one thought to the previous conversation. You used the word: "Is there any danger?" in the surveys, and there is a simple answer to that. The danger is once you involve people in a survey, you build up their knowledge and their expectations, partly through actually doing the survey and partly through their now realizing, oh, our management cares, they're gonna do something. The danger is to do this survey and not do anything then morale will actually go down and people will conclude that they've got a, a management that doesn't really care. So that's, that's the danger side of it. If you're going to do it, then follow it through with really a, a program of why you're doing it, how the feedback will be given back, what changes you will make, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the issue around what is culture is really different from the issue of how are we going to measure it and intervene around it. And we've talked about both aspects of it. And I guess the final word I would make is, I think what Peter and I have learned is that if, if you have a problem and you think the culture of the organization is something that may either help or hinder you, then you should do both a qualitative study by, you know, talking to people in groups to see what the shared values really are. And if you discover areas where a measurement might help you, then you could collectively decide to do a survey to, in, to broaden your base, to have more data, uh, and combine the qualitative and the quantitative data into an analysis of how, how what we have learned will either help us solve the problem or will identify areas where we actually may need to change some aspect of the culture. 
But the sequence has to be problem first, then qualitative, then quantitative, and then <clears throat> assessment of what do we do next. Thanks for your time, you guys. This is great. Will you come back on if we get requests? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. You mean right now? No, no, no. No, I mean, when we play this, I think people are going to be dying for more. So it, you can always propose some next. <laughs> I think you are the best person on earth. Thanks for your time, you guys. This has been great. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> What'd you think? It, 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 it's crazy. It ended kind of abruptly. I mean, I, I know it was kind of an abrupt ending. I was running out of Skype credit. I, I didn't have enough money on my Skype to finish the conversation. But that's all right, because I'm quite sure we could talk again. Here's my takeaway. If somebody in your organization has a bad knee, you don't need to give everybody in the organization an MRI. And that you want to value your ability to learn based upon your need to diagnose. But it's all about learning. And culture doesn't exist monoculturally. Culture exists in layers, in stratas, if you will. And different layers of the organizations are going to have different cultures, different values, different needs, different incentives. And I think nobody talks about that better than Edgar Schein. Uh, nobody. I mean, it's, it's remarkable how brilliant he is at every level. I, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I loved it. It's one of my very favorites. Here's my advice to you. Learn something new every single day, and I'm sure you did today. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, keep listening, subscribe, tell your friends, write a review, and be safe. Be safe.